Thanks so much. Thank you all for coming this morning. Um, so I will continue on that very positive note that Jimmy left off on. Um, and yeah, so the, I guess the, uh, the spoiler is that probably this news isn't going to be surprising. Um, it's certainly not super positive, but it might be in, in some areas uh, more than others. But what I really wanted to do today is talk about a study that uh, we just submitted uh, actually a few days ago um, that actually Kate uh, Miller here uh, and Camilla Serp really uh, led. Um, uh, and I'm just sort of the, the messenger here. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, but basically, uh, in the National Park Service system, you guys think Acadia, these all these resource areas. Well, there's a lot of other cultural sites in the Northeast, and maybe many of you know these or don't. My, I'm based in uh, Woodstock, uh, Vermont, about an hour south of here, uh, at Marsh Mills Rockefeller, which is one of the longest, you know, actively managed forests in the uh, country. And so there are a lot of these cultural sites that uh, visitors don't actually go to necessarily for visiting the natural resources, but they actually happen to have quite a bit of them. And our program uh, oversees and does a lot of the monitoring in those to make sure that we can infuse this information for planning and management into the future. Um, and I just wanted to highlight uh, Kate Miller here, who's our plant ecologist in Camilla Sarah. I've uh, been running this monitoring program since about 2006. Uh, really, really excellent. And so I just can't give them enough credit, uh, more than enough credit for everything here. And so if I misspeak about some of these results, that's on me. And so I'll, and I'll hear from that about Kate if you reach out to her. Uh, but basically, uh, the point is, is that uh, within our uh, program, we're monitoring uh, a lot of the forest uh, on these sites uh, uh, that, you, that you know. And again, there's a handful. Uh, there's some of the Acadia National Park and some of the well-known, the Appalachian Trails in here. But there's a lot of these historical sites with these significant resources. Um, and basically, every year we send crews that are conducting a sort of a basic uh, forest level uh, analysis, um, very similar to FIA protocols. Uh, within these parks. We've been doing this since about 2007. Um, but we've also, uh, and so this is actually our sampling design sort of in Marsh Buildings, which I don't know if you could see that well because of the lighting, but we've got this random sampling design. The point is, is it's a very similar monitoring protocol as um, FIA does this panel design. Um, I'm going to skip over this because that's not relevant. Uh, but what's also interesting is that we have another of other, uh, so my program, which is called this Network in Green, uh, we have other networks of parks that we're also doing similar monitoring. So we're acquiring this massive database uh, across the East Coast, and we're working together because we have similar methods to look at more regional patterns and also local patterns and trends, such as things like invasive species and forest uh, health in general. Um, and what I wanted to just uh, share with you quickly was that, um, you know, for the most part, a lot of our parks are really concerned and, and you know, invasive plants are really sort of eating our lunch, um, so to speak. Um, and a lot of these uh, are being driven by, we believe, by effects of uh, deer overabundance, there's land use effects, these common things that you can sort of hear about. And so today I just wanted to, I wanted to actually summarize a study that, uh, that we were doing was showing you some graphics from that, but I can talk about some of the preliminary ones here. Um, but basically, if we look across these uh, 39 units, um, well, this is a fun challenge for giving a presentation. Um, so if we look across these 39 units or so forth, we analyzed, uh, Kate analyzed the uh, trends in invasive uh, plants um, across these units over time. These have been monitored for about 12 years. Uh, there's collectively about 1,400 permanent plots here. Uh, and basically, they looked at using uh, sort of the, the common invasive species um, uh, within our databases. Uh, and she also analyzed these, and if I go back to our plot design, um, I'll find it here. It said she looked at these metrics at a couple of different scales. And so this is sort of our original our, our plot scale. And so we have about 1,400 of those across the U.S. Uh, but within that plot, she also uh, looked at the, uh, how the frequency of invasives were at the plot scale, how the frequency were at these quadrat scales, and then the, she looked at the trends and also the average percent cover. And these reflect a couple of different processes. So when we look at the percentage of plots that are um, being uh, colonized or that are colonized by invasives over time, it gives us a sense of how the spread is going on in general within each of these parks. Mm -hmm. If we're looking at sort of the uh, how the quadrat frequency is changing, that's giving us an idea of the smaller scale spread that's happening. And of course, if we analyze and look at trends in the overall cover, that's giving us a sense of the, the abundance zone over time. 
And so she actually did that across all of these uh, parks. And um, I'm going to focus uh, just a bit on the uh, northeastern parks here. Uh, but I, I did want to just kind of give you some of the uh, baseline results for that. Uh, basically, in almost every one of these parks, and uh, well over half of our plots, we have invasive plants. So invasive plants are pervasive in national parks, which probably isn't super surprising, um, or maybe a surprise to some. Um, the other interesting thing um, is that for the vast majority of our plots, we're seeing increases um, in, you know, over time. And these increases in the, in the parks that have the most issues with invasive species, as you could probably guess, are centered around areas of urban development. So the Washington, D.C. metro area, uh, Boston tends to be heavily invaded. Um, and even around sort of the uh, Hudson uh, River Valley. Again, these aren't really surprising. Uh, but what's worrying, and I don't have the graphic in here apparently to show you, is that the trend in these, if we're looking at plot level, quadrant level, and average cover, is that basically they're going up everywhere. So we're seeing that there's increases in spread. Um, we're not, we shouldn't, she didn't analyze species richness, but, um, but there's, if we're looking at all invasives, uh, there is increases in cover. And what's particularly worrying is that we're seeing these major increases um, in the, the cover uh, dominance of shrub invasive species, something like uh, Japanese uh, honeysuckle, uh, is entering into these parks and these areas and just basically up-competing everything. Um, what was also interesting uh, is that um, a lot, you know, the, the main species that we have across this network of, of parks is really, it's uh, Japanese stiltgrass, uh, uh, Rosa rugosa, uh, excuse me, uh, multiflora rose, um, and then uh, honeysuckle. So those are sort of our major dominant uh, taxa. And, and from a northeastern point of view, that's it's worrying because that's I think the flora that's coming to this area is already here, but it does tend to be concentrated around here. So when we look at the sort of broadest regional scale, actually compared to here, the, the least. Uh, 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 invaded areas within our parks are really fo focused within the Northeast, which I think is a really great thing. Um, and I'll run through some of these statistics, uh, you know, quickly. These have uh, changed a, a little bit, but these, but generally, the paper that hopefully will come out in a few months here is looking at this. It's sort of the, the, this is looking at the percent cover, and then these are our different units. And in the actual slides that I thought I installed, I put the states in, but this is Bar Harbor, Maine. Woodstock, Vermont, uh, this is Minuteman in Concord, Massachusetts, Morristown, New Jersey, uh, this is Hyde Park around the Hudson River Valley in uh, New York, St. Gaudens, which is in Cornish, New Hampshire, right uh, in, uh, along the Connecticut River Valley, Saratoga National Battlefield in Stillwater, New York, and then Rear Farm uh, Historical Park, which is in Wilton, or western uh, Connecticut. Um, and, and basically, as I was saying before, like we are seeing these general some detection of trends across some of these parks. And if we look at it, these different sort of uh, life histories or, or, or groupings, we definitely see some worrying trends with a lot of our, our shrubs. And, and in her analysis, and what's not being depicted here, is that all of these trends are significantly increasing. We do see some of them that are stable, uh, and part of that is really a testament to the, to the management of the parks. Uh, the park spent a lot of time uh, managing weeds. But what we are seeing, particularly worrying within these southern parks in New Jersey, uh, this is primarily driven a lot by uh, Japanese barberry, uh, completely overrun by deer. Um, Weir Farm, again, in Connecticut and uh, in Saratoga, we're seeing these real major increases within these invasive shrubs, which are not only sort of getting into these habitats um, and sort of persisting there, they're actually growing and expanding and becoming a major worry because of the influences that they have on regeneration and native plant, plant uh, diversity. Oh, uh, and this is just an example of that actually in uh, Saratoga National Historic Park where this is the park boundaries and this pot, the size of the pies actually show you the relative abundance within our plots of the different uh, species. So pie size is related to how much cover there are and then those different, and then you can see the, the composition of the invasives that are in there. And so exotic honeysuckle um, and common buckthorn, for example, are major dominant plants. Very similar picture is in Massachusetts in Concord and, and uh, glossy and uh, common buckthorn are major uh, uh, concerns there. Um, and 
I think one of the concerns that we have in these parks, or uh, it's a very compounded issue, and one of the primary speakers talked about this, is that uh, we have forests that don't have little trees in there. We're not really sure what those forests are going to look like. We definitely have evidence for uh, massive amounts of deer browse. Uh, and this is at the Ars uh, House in Hyde Park. Um, the other interesting thing is that in the understory here, uh, there are presence of non-native earthworms. And a recent uh, paper uh, by Nick Fisichelli and, and Kate as well has shown that there's these, and is what has been predicted uh, but through our monitoring data, that there's this positive feedback going on uh, that's actually involving sort of temperature, uh, non-native earthworms, and influences of deer um, that are essentially leading to greater non-species, non-native species richness, uh, which is obviously then related to uh, you know, their abundance. Um, and, and this is where, because I don't know what's next here. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, I, you know, I'm just going to stop there and just keep going on that note. So to bring this back to climate change, I think it's all, uh, you know, Park Service is well aligned and well informed about climate change as much as we can or can't be super vocal about it. But the point is, is that, you know, just like um, insects and so forth, physiological models predict, you know, that with more thermal energy, carbon dioxide, et cetera, et cetera, plants are going to be doing better here. Uh, and they, I think they're continuing to be, and everybody has seen this in the result of like the updates for the plant hardening results. There are areas here that were, in Marsh Billings, where I'm based, that were historically too cold, and Judy just mentioned this about insects, for certain species. And we think that as you know, climate warming is happening, that's going to just allow the marsh or Japanese steelgrass and other things to move up. So it's going to permit the, it's going to be a climate that permits those things to establish and grow. But I think what's also important here to understand is that for the invasives that are already here, that are already sort of eating our resource managers' lunch, these, these species are actually going to be growing faster as well. They're probably going to be more fecund and, and so forth. And so I'm not, I, you know, I know that there are predictions that we're going to be in a more invasive world, but one of the things I think we really like to see from the Park Service is, yeah, we're concerned about early detection species. We have to keep them out. We know that prevention is the best way to, to do that, but we have a whole bunch of other things going on in our parks that are probably going to be exacerbated by a warming climate. Um, and there's not really a lot of solutions right now to how to tackle that. So, you know, for example, in here, uh, one of the, our strategies, and we're working regionally now, is to develop deer management programs, but that's only part of the problem. And so uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of concern about, uh, say, the America's history. America's, you know, we're the America's storytellers. So a lot of these sites, although, again, were put down from FDR's sort of uh, palace, but they are representative of significant natural resources. And I wanted to just bring this up, not to sort of the, you know, the woe of, of uh, you know, of, to add to the sort of the, the challenges, but, you know, these are significant, we feel that these are significant data sets that we are happy and are really, uh, uh, I think um, it's great that we have appropriated funding to continue to use, uh, to do monitoring. And we'd like to see that these are integrated more with other types of, uh, you know, regional and national data sets, because in a lot of these parks, these are completely protected uh, areas. Where there, there is, you know, some management, again, from herbicide treatment and so forth, but for the most part, it's not sort of like a lot of private lands. Um, Marsh Billings is the one exception with some active logging, uh, but anyway, so I, I'll end with that, and I, and I really apologize. I had some, what I thought were some really interesting uh, slides there, but um, anyway, uh, thanks for coming. If you do have any questions about that study, and I can, and I get them at the have Kate's uh, um, contact information. And certainly contact me at the Kate Miller. She's easy to find. She's based at Acadia, but she's really the lead of all of this, and really I think deserves a lot of the credit. And knows these parks and the data and so forth intricately. And as of last year or so, we were sort of integrating our database into the FEMC greater sort of structure. So our regeneration data and other. Uh, forest level uh, uh, data is in there, plot level data is in there as well. So.
Yeah, so our philosophy with our program is that we monitor sort of in the background and we let our parks do things, you know, as well. And so the, 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 the short answer is that in some of our parks there is active management that's happening in uh, very close or on, on these plots. And that's uh, another added level of challenge of analyzing data. Uh, but Saratoga, as you said, you know, we can't have them. We send them these data and these maps so that they know where to actually go and treat for. And so we don't, aren't really here to do effectiveness monitoring, but we are able to look at our data in that lens when it's appropriate. So yeah, there is a, there is a certain level of management going on. Uh, and one thing I think is particularly interesting about Marsh Village Rockefeller, which has an active logging, is that you know, we know that disturbance is a, is, can be an issue in inciting some of these invasive you know, plants. And so we use uh, you know, colonization, so we use these data to try to infer a little bit about that. Um, but again, we have basically these spatially randomized designs, and so they don't always line up with management, and that was sort of the, the point. It was a great question, though. Yeah? In this monitoring class, are they monitoring all species, regardless of the base versus native? Yeah, so... They'll be catching new things that maybe are not on the monitor. Yeah, that's right. So uh, we do quantitative estimates of cover and things for every species. We're looking at trees all the way down to the herbaceous layer um, and looking you know, at the entire gamut of species uh, as possible. Um, and the biggest challenge we have, I think, are, are identifying grasses in New York. And we have really the contract botanists to do that, the specialists. And so we have a very rich data set of, um, yeah, you know, species, species level. Good question. Yeah? This is the um, nice job, by the way. <laughs> like, now you've done that in your life, and you'll never have to do that. That's <laughs> actually, this is, yeah, this is, that's, that's not the first time that happened. Thanks for those questions. Thanks, everyone.